Hello. This talk is Substitution Attacks Against Message Authentication and is joint work between myself and Bertram Petri. So in this talk, I'm going to first give a high level motivation as to where uh, the notion of algorithm substitution attacks came from. Then I will talk about uh, prior work on algorithm just substitution attacks, uh, looking at encryption as, a, as an example. And then I will move on to message authentication and our work. Okay, so the motivation really comes from the Edward Snowden revelations, um, which showed that there is a widespread mass surveillance of communications. Um, and that was done by uh, the US and UK spy agencies uh, together with maybe a few others. Um, and the good news from the Snowden revelations from the point of view of cryptographers uh, is that hardness assumptions aren't uh, haven't been broken. So in particular, there is no, um, sorry, uh, there's no <coughs> evidence that um, there's some secret supercomputer that can uh, break RSA or break of then any of the hardness assumptions that we assume that uh, hold. <coughs> but the, the bad news is that cryptography is being circumvented on a massive scale. So that might be through malware or through getting data and keys from corporations, planting backdoors and standards or mass collection of metadata. Um, so as an example, I'm gonna talk about the Jupyter Dual EC uh, pseudo-random number generator, which was uh, or is a, a dual elliptic curve deterministic uh, PRNG which is supposed to provide a source of uh, random or random looking numbers. But built in weaknesses with the choice of the elliptic curve points that parameterize the algorithm meant that uh, it's possible to choose the points in such a way that establish, uh, to establish a backdoor, which was observed by Ferguson and Schumo in 2005 at a, a romp session at Crypto. And then later, the Edwards Snowden revelations uh, suggested that uh, the NSA had influenced that design process. So this idea that uh, cryptography could be subverted, um, there is some evidence that that is happening in the real world or has happened. Um, and then before I go on to talk about um, prior work on algorithm substitution attacks and give some definitions. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the wider conversation, which uh, came out of a seminar hosted by Royal Holloway a couple of weeks ago, um, <clears throat> which really made me think slightly differently about, or question some of my assumptions around mass surveillance. Um, so cryptographers, as we know, are very interested in mass surveillance. And I think this is my personal opinion, but thinking about mass surveillance feels kind of like a, as close to doing something political as you can as a, as a cryptographer. Um, but uh, so the, the Royal Holloway seminar had the authors of this paper, Crypto and Empire, the Contradictions of Counter Surveillance Advocacy. Um, and as I understand their argument, it's that counter surveillance needs to be repoliticized so cryptographers thinking about um, very technical, kind of narrow questions uh, means that we don't have to take a political position. We don't have to think about um, who is being surveyed or for what reasons or um, what political forces or societal forces are, are going into that. We can just think about narrow technical questions. So I guess as an example, maybe after 9-11, uh, there was a mass targeting of Muslims and maybe uh, kind of directly engaging with why uh, Muslims as a group can be so easily targeted or, um, you know, some of the, the prejudices that uh, maybe we have as a society uh, against some of the minorities that end up being persecuted or surveyed or, um, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> is worth uh, thinking about. Um, so I don't really have time to go into this in any greater depth, but um, 
I thought it was uh, very interesting to think about and I, I'd recommend you have a look at the paper. Um, so continuing with algorithm substitution attacks and some definitions and looking at encryption as an example. Okay, so an algorithm substitution attack replaces a cryptographic scheme with a subverted version. And this subverted version is going to reveal to an adversary engaged in mass surveillance some information and it's going to do that whilst remaining undetected by its users. So here in this diagram we've got the adversary, we have Alice and we have Bob and Alice is sending some messages which are first encrypted to obtain these ciphertexts which are sent to Bob. And Alice and Bob they both share a secret key so Alice can encrypt using her secret key and Bob can decrypt using the same secret key. Um, so the algorithm substitution attack uh, would be to replace this encryption algorithm by an algorithm that behaves essentially the same way as the encryption algorithm would, but deviates in some way that the adversary is aware of and can look at these subverted ciphertexts and learn something. And the foundations of this idea was laid by Ai Young and Young uh, in a series of work they called Kleptography. And post Snowden, uh, the term algorithm substitution attack was introduced by Larry Patterson and Rogaway in 2014. And they showed how uh, an algorithm substitution attack could be launched against um, encryption, and they gave some definitions. And their attack and definitions were improved on by Blurry, Yiga, and Kane. Uh, and in particular, uh, their attack was stateless, where the, the Blurry, Patson, and Rogway attack had been stateful. And then later, the definitions that we used were critiqued by Gabriela, Fashion, and Puttering. And I think their key insight was that um, prior to this, so Bellary Patterson and Rogaway, they had insisted that um, the subverted algorithm is perfectly correct. Um, but that doesn't necessarily need to hold. If the algorithm deviates uh, very rarely, then it's very difficult to detect that. Um, so, in, in um, Gabriela Fashima Petring's work, there's this idea of a, a trigger message that an encryption algorithm could send. So it could just output the key like every once in 10 million ciphertexts or something. And that's effectively uh, an algorithm substitution attack that you wouldn't be able to detect. <clears throat> okay, so. Algorithm substitution attacks work by implanting a subliminal channel into ciphertexts. So continuing with this example of encrypted messages, this is what the uh, ciphertext could look like. It's obviously a toy example. Um, but if you imagine that the first bit of each ciphertext spelt out the secret key that Alice and Bob share, then observing the ciphertext, the adversary can now learn what that ciphertext, uh, sorry, learn what the secret key is. And to embed that subliminal channel, previous approaches use the technique of rejection sampling. So for encryption, uh, we have a key K, randomness R, and a message M, and the encryption algorithm outputs a ciphertext C. And for any randomness R, when you decrypt with that randomness, you get a ciphertext. <coughs> Sorry. You get a valid ciphertext. Which means that decrypting that ciphertext will give you the message that you started with. And that works for any randomness. So what you could do is just resample the randomness until the ciphertext uh, is in the right format that you want. So in our example from the previous slide, until the first bit is the intended bit of uh, the key that you're leaking. 
Okay, so this is generically a very powerful technique. Um, and you, know, you could leak the secret key. So you could also have some other message that you send in this subliminal channel. But if you send a secret key, that's kind of the most useful thing to the adversary because the adversary can now decrypt all of these ciphertexts. But I guess you could um, send some other message. But we're just going to think about extracting or exfiltrating the key. Um, some other work. So algorithm substitution attacks seem to be a fairly active area of research. Uh, just a couple of recent Tish papers that uh, found uh, signature schemes. Um, there's algorithm substitution attacks against cryptocurrency, uh, against uh, key encryption, key encapsulation mechanisms, sorry, and data encapsulation, data encapsulation mechanisms against lattice-based crypto uh, tweakable block ciphers. And there's also work looking at protecting against version attacks. For example, uh, you could eliminate the randomness and use non-spaced encryption. Or you could have keys that are so big that it's infeasible to exfiltrate them. Or you could sanitize the randomness in some way. Um, there's a technique called reverse firewalls. Um, and there's also something called self-guarding protocols. I'm not going to go into these um, in any great detail, but just to say that they're there is other interesting work out there. And lastly, there's also the idea of a, a watchdog algorithm. Okay, um, so now to move on to our work to talk about message authentication and our algorithm substitution attacks. So first of all, authentication uh, deals with a situation where Alice is communicating to Bob and Bob wants to know that the messages that Alice sends uh, really did come from Alice. So they haven't been tampered with or they haven't come from someone else that's pretending to be Alice. And to do that, we use a tagging algorithm. So Alice can take the message and then with the secret key that Alice shares with Bob, Alice can drive a tag and send that tag with each message. So now Bob, receiving the message with the tag, can check that the tag is really, really belongs to that message by using the secret key that's shared. And what you want in terms of security is that it's very difficult or impossible for an adversary to um, inject messages or to modify messages. So basically that means it should be very difficult to uh, calculate or create a tag that is valid for a message. Okay, so syntax wise, we have a tagging algorithm tag, tag T, key and a message. And then the verification algorithm takes the symmetric key K, a message and a tag, and then outputs V. So V will be zero if the tag is accepted, is correct, and V will be zero uh, if it's rejected. So one correct and zero incorrect. Um, and then as a correctness property of a message authentication code scheme, we want that all tags should be correct. So if, if, if Alice generates a tag for a message, then that should verify. So in contrast to prior work, uh, we look at subverting the receiver rather than the sender. Um, and there's no reason why when you have a Alice and Bob who have a shared key, you know, you could target Alice to leak that key or you could target Bob. And there's, there's no reason as to why you shouldn't target Bob. Um, and our attacks leak the secret key. Once the secret key is known, you can forge any tag, which you could use to, to um, enable attacks against confidentiality in the encrypt then Mac situation. You could get users to accept compromised authenticated software updates. So you can force malware on users, or you could inject malicious packages. 
<coughs> sorry, into secured communication streams to de-anonymize users. A more general attack, rather than trying to exfiltrate the secret key, you could exfiltrate arbitrary information, for example, uh, the key for a different application or the internal state of a, a random number generator. Okay, so syntax-wise, for subversion, we're going to denote that with the subscript J. So you have a subverted verify algorithm. It needs to have the same syntax, so it still takes a key, a message, and a tag, and it outputs a zero or a one. And in diagrams, I've added some horns to Bob to say that Bob is now subverted. And the verification algorithm is subverted, and so are the outputs here, potentially. Okay, so earlier I gave a kind of um, intuitive definition of what unforgeability means. You can quantify that by means of a game where the algorithm gets access to a tagging oracle and a verification oracle. And then you want a similar notion for subversion. So this time you have a, an adversary that interacts with a subverted tagging and a subverted verification algorithm. And it's maybe worth saying that um, if you, for example, just output um, a tag that was the same as a message, then that would be very easy for um, an adversary to uh, win some kind of unforgeability game, but it would also be very obvious to someone that's interacting with the algorithm that something has gone wrong. So you have some kind of basic a correctness requirement, otherwise you will kind of have some trivial uh, detectability. And that's other, another notion that you can make more formal. So for detectability, you have some uh, detector that's going to interact with the subverted tagging or verification oracles and needs to be able to work out whether it's interacting with a real or a subverted algorithm. So I guess intuitively a, a good algorithm substitution attack from the point of view of an attacker would be very difficult to detect, but would be very effective at leaking uh, the key. So that's uh, another notion which we've formalized as key recovery. And the important thing to note here is that you stop once the adversary has a key which is equal to the user's key. Um, but I'm not going to go into the full detail, but we, we have two different versions. We have a passive version with uh, just an eavesdropping adversary and an active version where an adversary can uh, craft their own tags. Okay, so passive version. So what we do is we subvert the verification algorithm so that it rejects a sparse subset of valid message tag pairs. So it needs to be a sparse subset because otherwise you have something that is uh, kind of easily detectable. And it works by taking the subverted verification algorithm is going to take the tag and compute the hash of it. So you obtain some index. And if the key at that index equals zero, then output v equals zero. Okay, so this should be uh, a correct tag, it should be v equals one, but this subverted algorithm is gonna output v equals zero. And the adversary can see this message and tag was sent by Alice, it should be accepted, but it's been rejected. So therefore, it now has learned one key bit. And we assume that the adversary can learn whether um, a tag is accepted or rejected. Um, so maybe that happens at a lower application level, and maybe a retransmission or something, but there'll be some way for the adversary to, to learn whether a, a tag has been accepted or rejected. Okay, so that's the, the, the attack, and it works fairly well. You have one bogus rejection per every second key bit on average to leak a whole key. And we can limit that bogus rejection rate even further with a parameter 
to make it less detectable. And what's happening here is that correctness is affected. So sometimes correct message tag pairs are rejected. And here's a nice graph to show um, the probability of a key being exfiltrated goes up nicely. So eventually, uh, once you have enough message tag pairs that you've observed, you're able to completely recreate the key. Okay, and there's a second attack that we detail an active attack. So this time we think about an adversary that is able to um, tweak these tags in some way or inject their own perhaps, which is a slightly different setting. So traditionally in the mass surveillance setting, we think about an adversary that's just eavesdropping. Um, but I think there's no real good reason as to why you can have an adversary that is um, active to some extent. Okay, so this time we take the verification algorithm and subvert it so that it accepts a fraction of invalid tags. So there's a nice kind of complement there with the, the passive attack. And to do that, the adversary takes a message tag pair that it sees and intercepts. And it then, if the tag um, so hash the tag and you get an index. If the key at that index equals to zero, then the adversary is going to replace the tag with an encrypted version of that tag, which I'm denoting P of T. So now the verification algorithm receives message with P of T. First, it will check whether the tag is authentic. So an authentic tag will still get accepted as it should. If it finds that this tag is not authentic, then it will check whether it's been encrypted in this special way by the uh, attacker, the adversary. So it will decrypt that to get back what should be the original tag. And now it will see whether that tag corresponds to the message. So if so, then it will set v equals to 1, when really v should be equal to 0. Okay, and if this tag is not authentic, this um, p inverse of what it received, then it will output uh, v equals zero as it should. So there's only a special kind of set of uh, message tag pairs that will bogusly be accepted. Okay, so when an adversary observes that a tag that it knows should be rejected has actually been accepted, it learns one bit of information. So one bit of information about the key. Um, so this time again, we've still got um, keys being exfiltrated with one bogus message tag pair for every second key bit on average. And this time we're uh, still affecting the authenticity because inauthentic tags will be accepted. <clears throat> and there's a similarly nice graph. Okay, so onto the conclusion. Our work in contrast to prior work attacks the receiver rather than the sender. And in the setting of symmetric cryptography where both sender and receiver share a key, that's um, something that's quite reasonable to do because either the sender or the receiver, they both have the same key, so you could target either. And we present two attacks that show targeting the receiver can lead to successful algorithm substitution attacks, leaking the private key. And we do that in two variants, passive and active. Um, and those are kind of suited to slightly different scenarios. So I think the high level takeaway is that proofs of security don't necessarily mean so much when the adversary doesn't play the games that we anticipate. So in other words, security is defined with respect to some model, but the adversary's hobby is to try and get you to go outside of that model. Um, so I'm going to finish on everyone's favorite uh, cryptography cartoon. And yeah, thank you very much.